He is risen. He is risen indeed. We are an Easter people, and even though the date on the calendar does not say this is Easter Sunday, we are still a proclaiming, a faithful, a living people that make the good news of Easter Sunday something that is a part of our everyday. And so as we gather and worship today and celebrate that good news, that promise, that gift, we come joyful, we come hopeful, we come free. And let us prepare for this time of worship, time of celebration, time of singing and praying, time of witness. And let us prepare for this as together we listen to our prayer.
5. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while walking along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he took in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Let us join together in prayer. <coughs> Gracious and loving God, we are so thankful that you meet us on the road, that you offer to us the opportunities to hear afresh and anew that which you have taught us and told us, that which you bring to our lives, the hope, the promise, the peace. We ask, O oh God, that on this day and this moment, that you would reveal yourselves to us also, that you would find ways that we might know you anew, that even as we proclaim the story of crucifixion, of loss, of hope and resurrection, that you would help us to see that these gifts are real in our lives. This week has been one filled with uncertainty, of wonder, of celebration, struggle. Each of us has walked a path taking us someplace maybe that we hoped to go, but maybe also someplace that we did not want to journey. The steps might have been hard, the destination unpleasant, it might have been a situation where we left wishing we did not have to go, but could stay. And yet you find us there. Find us even when we did not want to be in that place. And you're our companion, our strength, our guide. Even when we can't see you, and recognize you, you are there with us. May we be able to tell that story, not just the story of the empty tomb, but the story of your presence with us as we move forward and move on. 
tell the story, how we have seen you anew in our lives. Tell the story that you indeed love us and renew us and redeem us. We thank you for these gifts and for the time to focus, to wonder, to explore what the empty tomb means for us in our lives and means for our world. We give thanks through Jesus, your Son, our Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We spent Lent wondering about journey, didn't we? We thought a lot about what it would mean to be working towards something, working toward a goal, a, a destination, towards something different. It rarely is easy to embark on a journey to make that decision we talked about how it, 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 it's, it's a struggle, it's, it's a challenge. It takes planning, it takes setup. The willingness to leave one place to go to another. The patience to plan. The strength to risk. The, the courage to go in a new direction. All of these were things that made journey possible. But sometimes the impacts and the results of journey come upon us when we don't expect them. We, we sometimes find that special place, that favorite diner, that quiet park, that picturesque vista. When we were lost, or when we got turned around, or we were wandering, or maybe even when we were just trying to give up and go In today's text, the journey we witness is not one of accomplishment, it's not one of success, it's not even one of adventure or new blessing. It is a journey of disappointment and great sadness. It is a journey not just from place to place, but a journey through the landscape of loss. The landscape of grief, the landscape of emotional pain, the landscape of uncertainty. And we watched, right, as we listened to this text, we watched these followers of Jesus have to talk about the loss of Jesus with someone who clearly has not been checking their newsfeed. They have to rehash the hardest weekend of their lives with this total stranger who was walking with them all the way home. They have to talk about the very thing, yes, that they have been talking about with each other, but now they have to talk about it with someone who just won't get it. If this guy hasn't even heard of Jesus being killed, he certainly won't understand why this is so hard for us. We've had that experience before, haven't we? That experience where talking about something difficult, maybe we've done it with, with multiple people, but then all of a sudden to do it with a new person or a new setting, and a new context is just more than we can bear to do. That's why so often when we ask somebody how they are, we get what? I'm fine. <laughs> the travelers on the road find themselves in a situation where they, they feel like they, they have to answer this question, they, they have to at least tell a little bit about what they're talking about and what they're experiencing, even though they expect this man to not get it. But instead, when they tell him what they were talking about, about this horrible event, about how the women found the tomb empty and how others of the group confirmed this, but notice, they don't spend much time telling about why they think the tomb is empty. 
And they say that we've, they, we have reports that the tomb is empty. When they tell him this, instead of not understanding, this stranger begins to teach them. How, how could this be? How could this horrible walk home end up being a lesson about Jesus from someone that they have never met before? These are, these are folks in the inner circles of the followers, right? These are folks that knew Jesus directly, knew the work of the disciples, was part of this group. And here was someone they had never met before teaching them. How could this man, this person, who did not even seem to know Jesus had died, how could he be teaching them about the revelation of Jesus in Scripture? Sometimes on the journey, when we least expect it, we can find our destination. Because yet, here was this man, right? This journey of defeat was something else entirely at this point because this man was telling them so much and yet there was more to come to the story. Right? As Suzanne read, these men, as they approached their home, they, they asked if this, if this person, this teacher, would stay with them, if he would accept their gift of hospitality, if he would eat with them and spend the night and then start the rest of his journey wherever he was going, fresh the next day. They offered this gift of hospitality even in the midst of their grief and sadness. How many of us, when we're having a really bad day, really want house guests? <laughs> Anyone? And the man accepted. And of course, this is where the story gets good, right? This is where Jesus shows himself to them. And they understand that it was him all along. They understand why what he was saying seemed to make so much sense. Why their, their spirits were aflame as he told them about the scriptures and about Jesus. And as suddenly as they understood, he was gone. Now, our text today, I think, says this. It says, um, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. I don't think it was that same hour. I think it was probably as soon as he disappeared, they went running out of their house and they probably ran that full seven miles back to be where the disciples were and share with them this unexpected revelation from their journey. What do we learn? in the midst of the journeys we do not want to take. What do we learn when we are turned around lost? When our journey is one of sadness and pain, what do we learn about ourselves? What do we learn about God? What do we learn about our faith? This is the whole purpose of a journey, isn't it? It's never really about getting to a spot on the map or a date on a calendar. Our journey is about what did we experience as a part of what we saw, what we learned, what we ate. Right? How many of you have a story of traveling someplace that involves something you ate? <laughs> How many of you have made a trip just to go eat something? Yeah. That happens too, right? What we experience, what we did along the way is part of this journey. And the journey of the first followers of Jesus did not end with Good Friday. It did not end with Easter. The journey continued. The journey started long before us and it will continue long after us. 
but our part, our leg, our turn to walk this path has something for us to do, something for us to experience, something for us to take in and to share. The good news of Easter is that the journey did not end in death like they thought it had. The good news of Easter is that the journey is never ended by what we think might end it. The good news of Easter is that God is stronger than any limitation we can imagine, stronger than addiction, stronger than divorce, stronger than abandonment, stronger than grief and loneliness and fear. It's stronger than anxiety or unemployment. It's stronger than violence and war, and it is stronger than even death. The good news of Easter is what changes even the unplanned experience into a journey, turns even the slow walk of the pallbearer, the shuffle walk of older age, the brisk walk of adults without children along, the roundabout walk of being lost and confused. It turns even the limping walk of exhaustion and pain into a journey of discovery and grace and hope. What did they find? What turned their journey around? What showed these men walking home to Emmaus that God was good. Pastors class kids, what was in the text? I told you to look for it. What did we see? An example of what? The broken body. The broken body. Right? These followers of Jesus in the breaking of the bread knew Jesus anew. That's what showed them that the journey continues. Jesus showed them that the journey was not over. And this, this my friends, is what set apart our journey from those who walk with us that do not see Jesus with them. The presence of Jesus in our lives changes entirely the whole experience. The presence of Jesus in our lives changes how we see the world, how we experience the ups and the downs, and how we move through each day. The journey continued, yes, for these men, but it continued only because they saw Jesus with them. Easter makes a difference in our lives, yes. Easter is what changed the whole thing for the followers of Jesus. Easter is what changed defeat into victory and grief into joy. But the journey to the tomb that Easter day the journey back home for these men returning to Emmaus, the journey that we make, each of us. Jesus being with us in the journey is what made and makes the difference. So I ask you, what can the journey what can Jesus show you? Amen. We indeed are an Easter people. Our anthem this morning reminds us that our story, our witness, our journey involves the good news of a risen Christ, a risen Savior. Come to the time in our service, we have an opportunity to share witness 
make a proclamation of where we have seen God at work in our lives. So I invite you on this day, if you have a God sighting that you would like to share, I invite you to do so at this time. Vicky. I, <clears throat> I neglected to really make an announcement about uh, Chuck's condition about three weeks ago and spoke to people individually, but I'd like everybody else to know that that report was really uplifting, that um, the spot on his right side is gone, the one on his left is shrinking, and we go one week from tomorrow for mm -hmm. his monthly follow-up and we get to see the nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. We think that's really good news. And it's a, a God sighting. <laughs> Amen to that. Amen. We're so glad to hear that and to know that even in the midst of good news and the continued journey that Jesus is with you, walking beside you and bringing you through to the good news that we're celebrating together. We're so happy to get to do that. Any other God sightings that you would like to share on this day? Tammy. Well, I know that um, uh, we've been gone and then when we came home in the, the, traveling by car coming home, which we hadn't done for a while, um, and to re review all the beautiful scenery between Florida and here. But the day that we came home, Ron handed the car wheel over to me, and we hit thunderstorms and stuff. While they were getting tornadoes in Missouri, we were getting, you know, bad thunderstorms and stuff. So it reminded me of that song where Jesus take the wheel, <laughs> because it was really uh, kind of scary, and it brings you to mind that he's always in control. <laughs> yeah. And um, so uh, we were just thankful that we made it through all that and, and um, uh, felt his presence there that day. Amen. And I know you all have more travel coming here soon to go back down and close up that house and return. So we lift you all in traveling mercies um, as that journey lays ahead for you as well. The other God sightings. Ben in the back there. I'm good. I just want to say my God sighting was again Friday and Saturday seeing everybody from the church chip in to help out prepare and make the service. There's really so many from everybody from WOW to volunteers to just giving further of their time. God bless you all. Thank you again so much for helping and providing help and support. Thank you. The God sighting of all of those that were help, a part of helping to celebrate uh, Juanita's service yesterday and the good news of that proclamation of risen life for her. As we prepare to come to our table, we are mindful that even though at the table we recognize and we remember that struggle of the Good Friday and the long wait of those days after before the good news of Easter, we are an Easter people. Ultimately, the table is about that proclamation and celebration. And so this morning, our communion hymn is going to be one of our Easter favorites. Let us sing together, Christ Arose.
pastor's class was the week that we were focusing on what we do together at the table. We were focusing on the, the combination and, and the interplay between symbols and words, and how symbols and words give us meaning, create context, and give us parts and pieces to do and to remember and to use. We particularly talked this morning about how the, the remembrance of Good Friday, combination with the good news of Easter, puts us at a position of how do we remember that Monday Thursday meal? How do we remember when Jesus talked with his disciples about a broken body and blood that was shed? How do we place that sacrifice in the midst of our story, the midst of our faith? We talked about the words that people use at the table, the words of institution, right, class? We use that term. We talked about how some communion traditions use different sets of words. Even ministers within the same tradition sometimes might use different phrasing and, and different pieces. But what does it mean for us to think about a loaf of bread and a cup? What does it mean for us to talk about the broken body and the spilt blood? What does it mean for us to talk about the empty cross and the empty tomb? But most importantly, right, class, what was the most important thing we talked about today was that the table was an invitation for all. And who makes the invitation? Jesus, right? It's not our invitation. It's not our decision who comes. It is our role to set the table and welcome those who come to meet Jesus, to know Jesus, to receive the gifts that he has for us. That is the celebration of the table. That is the good news, the Easter story. It is what it means when we find that Jesus is with us unexpectedly, that we too have been invited and welcomed and loved. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we're so thankful for this table. We're so thankful for the journey that we are on that, that brings us here each time we gather and worship, that brings us here to remember, to celebrate, to mourn, to come and eat and drink and receive the gifts that you have for us. The gift, most importantly, of your love and your presence. And so as we come to eat on this day and to, to drink and to celebrate together, we ask that your spirit would fall new upon us, that we might see you afresh, that we might recognize you in our every day, that we might know when you are with us that our spirits of flame that our hearts filled with hope and our gifts being poured out might help us to live, to proclaim, and to share the good news that you indeed are risen in our lives and in the world. Together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory for it. Amen. On the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to each one of them saying, take and eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. And in like manner, he took the cup, he poured it, he passed it amongst them. He said, take and drink of this, each one of you, for this cup is my blood, which is poured out for you. Drink of it in remembrance of me. Just the reminder that as we come forward today to share in communion, we are going to be coming down the center aisle and receiving the gifts of bread and cup. I will tear a piece of bread from the loaf, serve it to you, and you can take the cup as normal and return to your seat via the side aisles. If you're unable to come forward and like, would like to receive communion in your seat, we would be very happy to do that. For friends, this is the table of our Lord. The gift, the opportunity, the welcome is offered by him. Come, eat, and drink. couple of reminders before we prepare to go out into the world. The first is that uh, fellowship reception following service today uh, be a little uh, more than our normal fellowship time, so please stay and join us for that. And speaking of fellowship, not next week, but the 30th of April, remi reminders that that's our Confirmation and Baptism Sunday. That morning at 9 a.m. will be our fellowship time prior to the service. That'll be an opportunity for our uh, baptismal and confirmation folks to be uh, here to visit with them and get to celebrate with them prior to the service. So we'll be having that instead of Sunday school on Sunday the 30th. So we're very excited for that day. And uh, just as a kind of a congregational note, this will be a Sunday where we will probably have a good number of visitors. So a good chance for us to stretch those muscles, those uh, welcome and friendly and helping to make sure folks um, know where things are and what's happening and, and how to be a part of service on that day. So uh, just so you are prepared and thinking about that, uh, we have a great opportunity to practice our hospitality um, mm -hmm. on that day as we have three families uh, that will be celebrating with young people um, in their uh, generations uh, gathering together to be a part of that day. So good news, good fun. Can't wait for it to happen. So that's coming up in two Sundays, the last Sunday of the month. And now as we prepare to go out into the world, may we remember that the journey did not end on Easter. That indeed we are an Easter people, but there is more to tell and there is more to share beyond just the good news that he is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us stand together and sing our closing hymn, Ours the Journey.
journey continue. And may you walk in the knowledge and the awareness and the vision that Christ is with you. May you celebrate. May you mourn. May you wonder. May you explore. May you live in the promise that Christ is with you. For he is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Amen and amen. Amen. amen.